Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night services here at Commissary, and we welcome those of you that are watching on Facebook. In a few minutes, we will um, have announcements. Uh, we'll make at least one announcement here. Uh, remember uh, the family of uh, Janet Clifton, who has passed away, and she was the wife of uh, Tana Lynn's cousin and uh, her funeral will be tomorrow in Wilmot. So remember that family. And uh, like I said, we'll have other announcements uh, then at the end of the end of the service. We are in uh, Revelation, the 14th chapter, if you'd like to turn your Bibles there, Revelation 14. Let's go ahead and start our class then with a word of prayer. Will you bow with me? Father, we're very thankful for the many blessings that you continue to shower down upon us. We're grateful for physical blessings, such as food, shelter, and clothing. And we're thankful for our friends and for our families. We're especially grateful for the spiritual blessings that we have through your son, Jesus. And we pray that uh, you'll bless us tonight as we study from your word. Pray that you'll be with those that are on our prayer list, those that are sick. We pray that you'll uh, be with their caregivers and be with their families. Pray that you'll be with those that are bereaved at this time, that you'll bring them comfort. Bless us then as we study your word. Help us always to walk in the footsteps of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We really haven't uh, progressed uh, any in uh, Revelation uh, in the last three weeks. It was on December uh, 13th that we were trying to finish up Revelation uh, 13 and uh, almost finished it up. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago we reviewed. Uh, and then last week, uh, Field and Allison was here and uh, he spoke to us uh, on the work that uh, he and Janet and others are doing in Africa. Very interesting uh, presentation. But uh, if you look at uh, the 13th chapter, the last part of it, and we'll, we'll just look at it briefly, uh, the last verse, and we touched briefly upon it last time that, that we were studying Revelation. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. And there have been a lot of uh, speculation as to what was meant by the number 666, and people have devised uh, various ways to uh, try to make uh, the letters of the alphabet stand for, you know, so many points, not only the uh, Greek alphabet, but the Hebrew alphabet and even the English alphabet. And the Bible was not originally written uh, in uh, English. And, uh, for example, they might say, well, A is worth, uh, you know, five points, B is worth uh, ten points, and they add all that up. And if they can make it come out to, uh, you take a person's name and make it come out to 666, and, and they uh, usually do some deductive reasoning. They pick out someone that they think it should apply to, somehow make uh, some formula uh, come out to 666. And a uh, lot of guesses as to uh, who is uh, uh, meant by the number 666. Some say, well, it was Nero. Some say, well, it could be Hitler. Some say, well, it could be uh, uh, Obama or, or Reagan or one of our presidents, uh, Henry Kissinger was one of the guesses, you know, but uh, I think that 666 probably refers to, um, to Rome. Rome is the culprit. Uh, Rome is uh, uh, the one that is, is persecuting Christians at this time. Uh, now, the one of the last statements we made as we were finishing Revelation 13 uh, three weeks ago was that uh, if it does uh, uh, 
uh, apply to a man, a person, then uh, the Roman Emperor Domitian might be a a pretty good uh, pretty good selection. Now, uh, the uh, ancient world uh, to the ancient world, the number seven was a perfect number. And uh, if you really wanted to emphasize perfection, you might say 777. Six is short of seven, is short of perfection. And if you want to emphasize uh, short of, a, of a perfection, then go six, six, six. And uh, so this is pointing to uh, a man or uh, a nation that is, that is evil, that's certainly far short of perfection. And I think that the beast uh, is, is, is the one, I believe that that's Rome. We looked at uh, some verses along that line. Now, uh, now if, you, if you go with Domitian, who probably was the emperor at the time that this letter was written to the seven churches of Asia, Pliny the Younger, was a Roman lawyer and author who lived in the first century. And uh, he said this about Domitian. Uh, and by the way, Domitian uh, was a son of Vespasian, who was emperor of Rome. And when he died, uh, his older son, Titus, became uh, the emperor. And when Titus died, then Vespasian became emperor in his brother's place. But uh, Pliny the Younger said uh, Domitian believed that Rome should be governed as a divine monarchy. And uh, Domitian's first act as emperor was the deification of Titus. Titus was his brother that had died, that had been emperor uh, after their dad had died. And uh, so he, he was uh, uh, made a, a deity made a god by the act of uh, his younger brother who is now emperor. Uh, and then uh, his infant son and niece were enrolled among the gods. This was another act of Domitian. Uh, and in addition to that, he gave himself the title of Lord and God himself. Uh, Domitian built the temple of Vespasian and Titus. Uh, a temple that was dedicated to the worship of his father and his brother because they were gods in his mind or in his teaching. Uh, Eusebius was a church historian and uh, he said that uh, uh, Jews and, and Christians were heavily persecuted during uh, Domitian's reign, especially toward the end of his reign. And so if 666 uh, is, is uh, meaning a particular man, Domitian would be uh, a good selection. More than likely, in my humble opinion, he is talking about the Roman Empire being uh, 666 and not talking about someone who crops up in history uh, 300 years later or 1,000 years later or 2,000 years later. Uh, that uh, wouldn't mean anything to the seven churches of Asia. So now uh, we go to chapter 14 in Revelation. Now, chapters 10 through 13, you know, they're, they're kind of difficult to understand. Uh, a lot of symbolic language there, as there is throughout the book of Revelation. And uh, we quoted uh, uh, some... Um, uh, some authors who, who said that uh, Revelation 11 was just one of the most difficult passages in, in all the Bible. Certainly one of the most uh, difficult ones to understand in the book of Revelation. Chapter 14, you just read through chapter 14, uh, and it seems to me, and it seems to uh, some uh, uh, commentators that, that I've read, to be uh, an easier chapter to understand. And so I want us to look at our, our questions here uh, in chapter 14. Uh, and uh, beginning with question one, where was the lamb standing? 
Where was the lamb standing? Okay, if you look at verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Now, you know, we sing the song, We're Marching to Zion. Because Zion, as it's used in the Bible on various occasions, refers uh, to heaven. Uh, where does the word Zion come? In the city of Jerusalem, um, there are several hills. They call them mountains. But having grown up in Alaska and Idaho, I, and I've been to Jerusalem, <laughs> they're hills, but they call them mountains. Uh, there's, there's Mount David, there's Mount of Olives, uh, and there is Mount Zion. Uh, and uh, Zion uh, is, is another name for Jerusalem. And in the book of Revelation, heaven sometimes is referred to as the New Jerusalem. And I think that uh, here, uh, he says the Lamb was standing on, uh, on Mount Zion. And I think what he's going to show here is, is uh, a victory, hope uh, for the seven churches of Asia that to when all is said and done, the Lamb is going to be standing in heaven. And who would the Lamb be? Well, uh, we have various verses uh, throughout Revelation that indicate that the Lamb is Jesus himself. Uh, and... Uh, then uh, look at uh, the entire verse. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Now, earlier in the seventh chapter, we read of the 144,000, uh, and... Uh, some people believe that only 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. And it's a complete misunderstanding of what John was saying in Revelation 7. 144,000 probably refer to the, to the Christians that were still on the earth. And also in, in Revelation 7, there's a reference made to multitudes who are in heaven. Uh, you got, you got two groups there. you got the 144,000 uh, representing God's people. Uh, it's, it, it's a figurative uh, number. Uh, and the 144,000 here probably represents uh, the faithful Christians at the end of time. Uh, you got uh, Jesus standing in heaven. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he's uh, there with, with the faithful, the ones that have lived uh, faithful Christian lives. Uh, and... Uh, Let's see what question number two says. Okay. And uh, question number two was, what was written on their foreheads? And if you look here, it says, with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Well, again, this is figurative language. Uh, and uh, I think that this is another way of saying this identifies ownership. You know, the name of Jesus, the name of God the Father. You know, uh, these people belong to God. These people are the faithful ones, what it seems, uh, seems to me. Uh, any comment you want to make? Question number two, uh, well, question number three. Describe the voice that John heard. Well, look at verse two. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Uh, if you've ever been by a roaring river, uh, the noise that it makes can just be a, an overpowering noise. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, we know the sound of thunder and, and uh, this voice was like roaring waters. It was like thunder. Uh, and uh, it was loud. But then also, it was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Uh, 
and some commentators say it was a precious sound. It was a, a sweet sound. I mean, how can something be uh, loud uh, and roaring like a river and, and like thunder and yet at the same time have that sweet and that precious sound? Well, that's the voice of the voice of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, divinity, voice that comes uh, out of heaven. Uh, have to be careful that we don't read too much into that. Question number four, what did they do before uh, the throne? Okay, what did they do before the throne? We're talking about the 144,000. They're singing a new song. And they sang a new song, verse 3, before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And then if you look at the last part of question four, who could learn this? Who could learn this song? Well, not just anybody. He said, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Only, only those uh, faithful Christians were able to sing that song, were able to learn that song. Uh, they're singing this song, song of, of, of praise. Uh, any comment you want to make? Now, the fifth one then says, describe the 144,000. Well, look at verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Uh, a picture of uh, uh, not perfect people, but a picture of people that uh, are righteous uh, and obedient uh, is what uh, it, it shows uh, to me. Don't think it's over overcomplicated. Uh, okay? Uh, now look at question number uh, number six. What did John see flying in mid heaven? What did he see? Look at verse six. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Uh, and so when you look at question number six, uh, uh, what, did, uh, what, did this, what was this being going to do, question number seven? Well, he was uh, preaching the eternal gospel to those who were on the earth. Uh, the gospel had been, had been preached. Uh, now look at question number eight then. Uh, what did he say with a loud voice? Well... Just going right down, he says, and another angel, a second one followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Now, what do you suppose Babylon refers to? Not, not the actual literal the city of Babylon, it had fallen a long time ago. He's talking about Rome. Rome was the culprit. Rome was the one persecuting the early church. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and the book of Revelation is, is a book of encouragement. It's a book of hope uh, to the seven churches. That, uh, yes, you're, you're going to go through some bad times. Some of them had already, when you look at the letters to the seven churches in, in chapters two and three, some of them had already suffered a little bit, and there was gonna be more to follow. But when all is said and done, if, you're, if they're faithful to God, if they're faithful to God, everything's gonna turn out all right. Go back to Revelation two, verse 10, in his remarks to the church at Smyrna, he said, uh, be faithful to death, and you'll receive a crown of life. Be faithful even to the point of death. Be faithful even if you have to die for it. Your reward will be a, a crown of life. Uh, and, and so now uh, we, we have uh, a picture of, of the victory at the end of time 
and uh, they're going to receive uh, they're going to receive uh, a glory. That's question number. Uh, that's question number uh, eight, wasn't it? Or question number? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, if if you look at look at verse. Uh, uh, Look at verse eight again. Or look at, let's look at seven and eight, and and we skipped over seven. And he said with a loud voice, "Fear God, and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of water." And another angel, second one, followed, saying, "Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine." of the passion of her immorality. And so he's picturing things at, at, at the end of time. Uh, he's picturing uh, the, uh, you know, the defeat of, of the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, and the Roman Empire did fall. And, and you sort of get a, a picture even, even of, of the final destiny. Rome fell a long time ago in our past. So, so how, can, how can we read this and receive the same kind of hope that, that, that they received. Rome was going to fall. Well, there's still forces of Satan uh, in the world today. Uh, there's still difficulties that we, that we go through. Uh, maybe not to, to the same extent that the seven churches of Asia did, but we still have difficult times. But we stay faithful to God, and in the end, victory. In the end, a crown of life. In the end, we can say the forces of Satan have been defeated. And uh, what a glorious uh, message uh, that is. Look then at, at question number uh, uh, number 10. What did the third angel say would happen to those who worship the beast? Look at verse 10. Uh, well, then another angel, a third one, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also would drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the of the Lamb. Okay, that... that uh, uh, answers questions 9 and 10. If you look at question 10, what did the third angel say would happen to those who worship the beast? Now, uh, you remember that earlier, uh, I believe it was in chapter uh, 13, uh, only those that had a certain mark were allowed to, uh, to participate in commerce. And if they didn't have this certain, certain mark, uh, they, they, couldn't buy, they couldn't buy food. You know, uh, and and uh, history reveals that Rome uh, did require, uh, you know, certain marks. Uh, it might be a coin, uh, you know, in order for people to actually uh, actually trade and buy things. And it made it made it. And, and this was given to those who gave their allegiance to to uh, Rome. It, it was it was given to people that gave their allegiance to. To uh, the emperor and worship and worship him as as God, and those that those that uh, didn't didn't get the didn't get the mark. Sometimes it some have said it might even been a, a tattoo on their body, or it might have been a coin. And this seems to be a reference to that when when he when he says here, uh, uh, if anyone worships the beast, that's Rome. And his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. This is what's going to happen to him. Uh, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. He'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. So he's saying there's going to be payday someday uh, for these uh, for these individuals. Uh, any comment you want to make here? Payday someday. Okay, then look at uh, question uh, number 13. Uh, and question number 13, uh, question, 
Let's see, are we down to question 13 yet? Well, we've answered number 11. With what our disobedient going to be tormented? Uh, okay, let's look at question number 12 too, because he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, look at look at verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Why do you suppose uh, that? Uh, the disobedient are going to receive no rest night and day forever. That's just, uh, you, you're not going to, uh, you know, look at Revelation 14 and, and it's going to give you that answer, but I'm just saying, you, why, why do you suppose they're not going to receive any rest night and day forever? If you're tormented, receiving punishment would be hard to rest, wouldn't it? Uh, and, and so uh, the, the, the end of, of the disobedience is going to be a terrible thing. Um, Not only that, but, you know, the regret, because they think back over their lives. Yeah, and Jesus teaches that in Luke yeah. 16 with the, with the, with the uh, story of Lazarus and, and, and the rich man, you know. He, re, you know, he regretted it. He wanted uh, Lazarus to go back and warn his five brothers. So, uh, you know. And with the regret uh, and, and with the torment, how are you going to rest, you know? Uh, and uh, th there is no rest uh, for, you know, you've heard the saying, there's no rest for the weary. Well, there's no rest for those that lose their souls. Now, question 13. According to John, who is blessed? Who is blessed? Look at verse 13. And uh, Evan and I have used this verse often. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Not just all the dead. He's already mentioned that some, when they're dead, they're going to be punished forever. But blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit so that they may rest from their labors. Remember the others, no rest night and day forever. But those who die in the Lord, they do rest from their labors, okay? And their deeds follow with them. I think uh, King James, New King James may say to follow after them. Uh, reminds me of Hebrews 11 and verse four, uh, uh, Abel, you know, though being dead still speaks, you know. Uh, and, and uh, how many of uh, uh, people do you know? How many uh, fathers and mothers and grandparents and uncles and aunts and uh, faithful members of the church that we've had here who are now gone, yet they still speak? We remember their example. We remember their teaching. Uh, and, and, and we see it uh, in, their, in their children and their grandchildren, you know. And, and so uh, he said, these people, they will rest from their labors, but their works... They, they follow after them. Now, look at question number 14 then. What Old Testament verse is similar to verse 13? I know Evan knows. But what, what verse? Just go ahead and say. Repeat it for me, please. Huh? Repeat it, what did you say? Yeah, yeah the Old Testament verse. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to put you on the spot, am I? You do me that all the time, yeah. so... <laughs> Okay, Psalm 116, 15. Uh, yeah, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of uh, his saints. You knew that. <laughs> but uh, that's question number 14. Uh, who's sitting on the white cloud? For, uh, question 15. One like the Son of Man. This has to be Christ. Uh, we're going to, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Uh, I, I really was trying to rush through that and get through this, but we'll, we'll start with question 16 then uh, next Wednesday night, Lord willing. We're going to break for a few minutes and then have our announcements and, and our uh, worship service.
Okay, good evening to you. Glad to see each and every one tonight. Those of you that are visiting with us on Facebook also. I'm back through the announcements, similar to, there's one or two new ones, but remember Teresa Chipman, she had surgery and she's doing well. Chester's brother, he, he uh, still okay, Chester? He's holding his own. Kind of holding his own, okay. So remember him. James Duncan's sisters, Linda Robinson and Kathy Greenwood. Daryl Clifton's wife, Janet, has passed. This is Tom's relatives. Service will be tomorrow in the south somewhere. Okay. Randall Glover has upcoming surgery, remember him? Uh, Peggy Carr's brother, Brad Heaton, has been passed. Remember uh, others that we have been have announced that have lost family members. Jeff Brasher will have a heart cast tomorrow at AMMC about 10 o'clock. And Shane's Mother, Shane Swick, mother, was found unresponsive, but she has uh, doing uh, some better, and she is in uh, Rockford, Illinois. To remind you to silence your electronic devices if you haven't done that. We'll be back again Sunday morning at 9.30. I invite you to be here with us. Are there any other announcements we need to make that I don't have here? I do have one to recognize tonight. I don't know how many of you get the, uh, I want to call it the magazine, the paper from college, but there's an article in there about a fellow named Art Smith. They have an endowment fund that's created in honor of CRC great Art Smith, and there's an article in there by his son, Kate, and uh, we want to at least recognize Art and his family for that. They says they won the uh, Spirit of America Award there this year, so uh, congratulations to y'all. I'll post this on the, the bulletin board out there and you can look at it if you would like. Nice article by Kate. Anything else? If not, Wes going to lead our singing and Brother Dickinson will have our devotional. Wade has a closing prayer and now Dan will lead us in our opening prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful to you for many blessings. We're entering into a new year. Our prayer is that we will do the things you would have us to do and that we'd be a light to a dark world. We also ask that you forgive us of our wrongs and help us to always remember that Christ's blood continuously washes away our sins we are obedient to your will. We're thankful for having the opportunity to be in a new year. We pray that when we have opportunity that we do the things you would have us to do to those around us. That we would be the good neighbor. We would show them your son Christ. By living in a way that people would ask us the hope that is within us and why we're happy. We've had loved ones, and we've mentioned this evening, of those who have been lost to this world, but not to you. We have their memories. We have their guidance that they gave us. We are so thankful that we live in a world in which we can tell others and in a country that we can worship freely. Our prayer is that our leaders will do as you would have them to do and lead us in the right way. As we enter into this worship service now and we sing praises to you, thank you for the avenue of prayer that we can come before you 
and tell you what's on our hearts. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. Six hundred eighteen.
674. 674. <coughs> Good evening. Well, Art, since there's a celebrity in the audience, I'd gladly yield the pulpit, you know, if you yeah. guess that means no, huh? Do you ever think about time? Do you ever think about what time is, how much time you've got, how much time you don't have? I guess I think about it more the older I get because I figure I don't have as much as I used to have. But in one sense, we've all got the same amount going, you know. We may not live all of it here. But uh, eternity's a long, long time. A fellow named Dr. Benjamin Mays, I have no idea who that is, but he wrote a poem that reminds us of the time that we have. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. So, a lot to think about right there. We really don't need to waste our time on things that don't matter. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, he said, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then in another place, we're told in Colossians 3, 23, 24, Paul tells us that whatever we do, do our work heartily. As for the Lord rather than men. And so whatever we do with our time, we need to do it in a way that will please the Lord. Y'all probably never, you know, I think weird stuff sometimes. But do you ever see something on TV like a documentary from World War I? Or maybe seeing the Brooklyn Bridge being built? Or seeing, you know, something way back then. Does it ever cross your mind that nobody in those pictures are still alive? In the whole wide world, nobody, anywhere, they're just gone. Nobody's still alive. I recently saw a writing about time that, that really made me think about all this, which is kind of what made me come up with this tonight. It was titled, In 100 Years. In 2124, we will all be buried with our families and friends. Strangers will live in our homes that were so hard to build. Someone else will own everything we have today. Most of our possessions will be given away or thrown out and destroyed, including the cars that we spent a fortune on and which will probably be scrapped. Our descendants will hardly know who we were, nor will they remember us. How many of us know who our grandfather's father's father was? After we die, we'll be remembered for a few more years, and then we're just a portrait from someone's wall. A few decades later, our history, photos, and deeds disappear into histories of oblivion. We won't even be memories. If we pause one day to analyze these questions, perhaps we would understand how pointless it is for us to worry about 95% of the things that consume our minds daily. If we could really think about this, our thoughts would change. We might do things differently. We might feel more free to enjoy ourselves and the lives that we're living. Just depend on the Lord. Take these thoughts into the rest of your day, this week, next year, and just remember this saying, if it's not going to matter in five years, don't spend more than five minutes being upset about it. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Now, as we talked about earlier, our, our deeds go on. You know, some people are going to remember, but, you know, in fairness, folks a hundred years ago that were sitting in this building or any other building, you know, we, we probably don't remember a whole lot about them. The only thing that really matters here and now is how we live our lives here. That's what matters. In Matthew 6, 25 and 26, the apostle says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So basically, this is telling us not to worry. And there's a difference in not worrying and not being concerned. If we get sick, we need to be concerned enough to go to the doctor and try to, you know, try to get well. We need to be concerned about how to pay our bills, how to, how to live our lives. We just don't need to worry about every little thing. I was at the Labor Day picnic at Rector a few years ago, and I saw one of my cousins, and I said, Hey, is, is your mama here? He said, she sure is, but don't ask her how she's doing, no matter what you do. 
and he meant it because she would give you the rundown on everything that was wrong with her and anybody else. She was a chronic warrior, and that's what we don't need to do. We need to depend on the Lord for a, a whole lot of things. We can make mistakes, right? I make a bunch of them, but don't dwell on them. Philippians 3, 13 through 15 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things that are behind. Am I the only one that ever asked for forgiveness for the same thing more than once? The same incident, maybe. Not even the same. You know, oh, oh, by the way. Well, over Isaiah, we're told that God forgets. When he forgives, he forgets. It says he will not remember our sins. And sometimes I think, you know, he's thinking, what would you remind me of that? I, 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 I'm done with that. Anybody ever think that? Because I do. I've been guilty of saying, oh, you know, I really wish, you know, when that should be just absolutely gone. So we need to we need to live our lives that way too, remembering that if we make a mistake, we still we're okay. The goal that he speaks about here, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize. Well, in 2 Timothy 4, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's what the goal is. That's what somebody once said that we're not a citizen of this world, we're a citizen of heaven that's just trying to make our way through this world. And I think that's correct. I'm sure that, that many of us have talked to folks about their souls and their salvation and their beliefs. And have you ever had somebody tell you, well, well I'm thinking about that but I need to do this or that first, and then I'll think about being a Christian. Have you ever heard that? I think there's examples in the Bible, people that said that very same thing. Well, you know, later, later I'll think about it. Don't think about it so long that you fail to follow Christ. It's really bad to think about somebody that dies that was thinking about being a Christian, that knows what they should do. They're thinking about it, but they never get around to it. It's also heartbreaking to hear of a Christian who thinks that someday, well, I, I know I'm wrong, but someday I'll repent and I'll get back on the right path. And they never do. We can't afford to die thinking about it. We just need to always try to be the old deal about pray without ceasing. We always need to be in a, in a state of mind where, where we're cognizant of what we're doing and that we, we live, live this time that we have here in the correct way. Because life is indeed a vapor. We all know that. It doesn't matter how long it is compared to eternity. It's just a vapor. wonder why the Lord wastes around. 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Sometimes I think the reason, my opinion, the reason the Lord lets this old world stand as long as he has, he's just patient. He's wanting more and more. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants to give everybody through their lifetime a chance to come to him. He's patient, a lot more patient than, than I am a lot of the time, I'm sure. If there's anything that you do need to do, if you've got any, if you need to repent, if you've got any qualms about anything you've been doing, if you just need the prayers of the church, today would be a really good day to do that. If there's anything that you need whatsoever, we invite you to come forward as we stand and we sing. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come?
Let's pray together. <clears throat> Holy Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for loving us so much, so much that you've done for us as we live here on this earth, as we have the opportunity to uh, prepare for heaven if we uh, take the choice that you have given us through the sacrifice of your son. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you provide us here in this lifetime on earth. We thank you for your church. We thank you for the break we take from the rest of the world each time we gather here. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made. We thank you for the blessing of prayer, Father. It's so hard to understand for us that you, the creator of heaven and earth, are always ready to listen to us anytime we'll take the time to talk with you and the comfort that you provide us that only you can do and ready for us to provide that anytime we'll take the time. Father, we ask that you stay at that, keep that in our mind as we go through the rest of the week, as we go about our daily lives until we come back here together again. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.